Hey, how's it going? My name is Tony and I am so privileged to be here today and take this opportunity to speak to you about a subject that is so important, so vital to our spiritual lives. And that subject is worship. Worship is a central aspect. It is a core tenet to our faith. And it's an expression of our love and our devotion to God. And it's as essential to a believer as breathing. The Bible tells us to allow and encourage everything that has breath to praise the Lord. We were made, we were created. It is at the core of our very existence to praise God and to be a testimony to his wonderful workmanship and his sustaining power and love. In so many Bible verses, such as Psalm 95, 6, the Bible teaches us the significance of worship. It says, come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. In Philippians 3, 3, Paul says, we worship by the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. These verses show us that worship is not just an external act, but it's a deep internal expression of our hearts. And more importantly, that worship is one of the primary vehicles by which we span the gap from the natural to the supernatural. Many of us might think of worship as what we experience in a church service, like singing hymns or praying, but worship can actually take so many forms. Let me explain in a way that makes sense to me. I love video games. And if you're watching this, chances are you do too. I, I really like them because even though I'm not a street fighter or a survivor of a zombie outbreak or the last hope against an alien invasion, when I play games, I love them because they allow me to escape from the mundane routines of my everyday life into this fantastic world where I have power and purpose. And if I play well, victory. In the real world, the place that we all live that captures so much of our attention and energy and effort, it doesn't always feel that way. So when I enter into worship, when we focus our hearts on the Lord, I begin to pay attention to a heavenly reality that I sometimes overlook when my mind wanders from the goodness of God. So just like a video game helps us to visit strange new worlds and achieve impossible exploits, worship allows us to escape the mundane and connect with the divine. In worship, we can let go of the worries and the stresses of life and enter into the presence of God. We can bask in his love and we can feel his peace. And in declaring his goodness, we acknowledge an unseen truth that spills over and affects every part of our everyday, regular lives by putting our every problem, our every hope and ambition in perspective with the power and the grace and the goodness of our heavenly relationship. And that makes everything else seem less important or daunting or overwhelming by comparison. There's an old song that said, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I know, I'm old, I probably just dated myself there. So you think about it, when you're playing a video game, you become fully immersed in the experience. You work hard to overcome challenges, to reach the next level, to save the princess. And when you do, you feel a sense of accomplishment and joy. Similarly, worship allows us to immerse ourselves in the presence of God. We offer our hearts and our minds to him. And in return, we receive a sense of peace and fulfillment that can't be found anywhere else. Just as the games we play allow us to escape into these fantasy worlds, Worship is an opportunity to escape the mundane and connect with the divine. We are called to worship God in spirit and in truth, as it says in John 4, 24. This means that our worship shouldn't just be a routine or a performance, but a genuine outpouring of love, devotion, gratitude. And it's hard sometimes when one of our primary modes of worship is through music, because music, even music that's written to honor God, is first designed to appeal to us. Uh, picture this, it's easy to imagine. You, when you hear a worship song that you like and you're like, that's my jam. And then you engage with it like you would any other song from the perspective of rhythm and melody as opposed to spirit and truth. And it's hard sometimes to get out of that mode, especially since there's a lot of modern worship that just slaps. Am I too old to say things like that? It's giving, it sends me, whatever, you know what I mean. But worship music and worship services, even though they appeal to our senses, they have to go beyond that. Otherwise, we're just going to a concert and singing about Jesus. I don't mean to speak for God, but I have a hard time believing that he's honored by us singing about him like he's not in the room. He desires and deserves our undivided attention. So another nerdy thing I like is comic books. I love reading panel to panel and discovering fantastical worlds and heroes with superhuman abilities. Comic books inspire me to want to be a hero in my own life. 
And there's a real temptation to let the feelings that worship gives us excite us to be heroes in God's story. I mean, we are given the power of the Holy Spirit and we're tasked with spreading love and justice in a world that desperately needs it. In Colossians 3.16, Paul says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Worship gives us the wisdom and the encouragement that we need to be a light in a dark world. We need to never forget that the story is not about us. We're honored by God to be invited into the story, to play a part, a role far greater than any of us deserve. But Jesus is still the main character. He always has been, he always will be. Before we go running off thinking that a worship experience is designed to empower us, it's really designed to exalt the one who empowers us. It's all about him. Sometimes we lose sight of that. In Deuteronomy 6.5, we're told to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. And worship is a way for us to demonstrate this love. As we sing, as we pray, as we offer our hearts to God, we're expressing our love and devotion in kind of a tangible way. In doing this, we're honoring him above all, seeking first his kingdom, submitting ourselves to him and acknowledging his majesty. Only from the posture of humbling ourselves in worship does God promise to lift us up. And as we draw near to him, he can and does draw near to us. That's the real stuff. That's what changes everything in our stories and in our lives. We all worship something. If it's not God, it could be our possessions, our career, our relationships, our sports teams, our hobbies, our status. Look and see what captures your thoughts and your passions and your affections. And you'll find out quickly what or who is at the center of your worship. Is it God, the creator of the universe, the one who spans eternity, who spoke the world into existence, our creator, our sustainer, and through the Lord Jesus Christ, our savior, is the only one who's worthy of our worship? Because if it is, then it's our willful engagement as worshipers that establish that truth for our blessing and for his glory. Worship, while done corporately, really is a personal examination of God's worthship to you and your will and your choice to affirm that worth in word and in deed. I think that's why worship feels good to us, because when we sing the words of a hymn or a worship chorus that particularly resonates with our own experience of who God is, we really begin to declare his worth in spirit and in truth. And it's deeply personal. Let me share one last story. When I was in college, a friend of mine was a manager at a large science fiction and fantasy collectible retailer. And one evening, they were having this private party in the store after closing, and he invited me. I didn't think too much of it, just kind of a chance to hang out with my friend and a couple other nerdy people. But when I got there, I was surprised at what a soiree it actually was. It wasn't what was happening that caught me off guard. It was who was there. At this event were two actors whose faces I wouldn't have recognized, but whose reputation preceded them. So at this party was a man named Jeremy Bullock and a man named Peter Mayhew. Now for those of you who are uninitiated or having a hard time placing the names, they were the actors who played Boba Fett and Chewbacca the Wookiee in the original Star Wars trilogy. These are characters that I'd seen on the screen my whole life and I immediately knew I had to find a way to get across that party to where they were and to meet them. And, and I watched them and I saw them talking to people. I even saw them signing a few autographs and I knew that like my night would not be complete if I couldn't go over there and talk to them and get an autograph for myself. Now this was before the day of selfies, you know? So I had to be resourceful. I, I, I had to figure out a way to make this kind of last. And I just remembered that Kenner had just released the Power of the Force action figure line. And I took a long shot and I stepped out of the party and ran across the street to a Walgreens drugstore. And they had, I kid you not, on their toy aisle, two Star Wars action figures, a Boba Fett and a Chewbacca. And I'm like, yes, the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting. I had bought them without hesitation. I made my way back to the party and I tried to get close to them without looking like I was trying to get close to them. You know, I was flying casual. And after what felt like 10 years of trying to build up the nerve to approach the Wookiee and the Bounty Hunter, I finally made eye contact with Jeremy Bullock and I decided to go for it. I was sure that I was super chill and subtle walking up to him with my action figures in my hand. <laughs> and I started talking to them and they were insanely nice and it was a great encounter. And I got to ask them questions about the movies and they were gracious and, and, and wonderful, just charming about the whole thing. I almost forgot to ask for an autograph, but Jeremy, yeah, 
Jeremy, you know, we're on first name basis like that. Jeremy asked me if I'd like one. And I'm like, yes, all of the yes. So I handed them my figures and they both signed them personalized to me. I still have them right here. You can see to Tony, be cool, Jeremy Bullock, Boba Fett. Boba Fett told me to be cool. And to Tony, Peter Mayhew, Chewbacca. How rad is that? When I got home, I told some friends about this experience and they were disappointed in me. Then I had them put my name on them because there was a new website called eBay. <laughs> and they said, yeah, I could have sold them and, and made a lot of money. They said, because it had my name on it, it was worthless to a collector. But you see, I didn't see it that way. I had a great personal encounter with someone that I looked up to and was excited to be with and who knew my name by the end of the conversation. My friends, see their knowledge of the bounty hunter and the Mandalorian armor was limited to seeing him on a screen, but I got to spend time with him, to be with him, and that made this figure worth more to me. And here, over 25 years later, these figures are still treasures in my collection. In the same way, when you worship, you can have a personal encounter with the God of heaven, and he speaks to you, he knows your name, and he leaves you with something that others may not see as valuable. They might limit it only to the value of a good song or, or technical music performance or maybe a cool light show. But if you enter into his presence with thanksgiving and with praise, you're gonna find out that the everlasting goodness and the mercy that the Bible offers aren't just words on a page written for and about someone else. They become yours, his promises, signed and sealed with your name on them. You show the world what that's worth to you when you choose to live a lifestyle defined and directed by worship. In conclusion, worship is not just a Sunday morning obligation. At its heart, whether it's expressed in song or in dance or in art or writing or in a quiet time just waiting on the Lord, worship is about establishing and declaring what God is worth to you. It's a journey to the heart of God. It's a journey that transforms us into better versions of ourselves. The best thing about giving God honor, because he's the one who upholds us, when we lift him up, it pours back into us. When we make him great in our lives, he in turn becomes greater in our lives. So let us embrace worship with open hearts and minds. And may our worship inspire us to see God as the hero of our story. And in doing so, empower us to be the heroes that God created us to be. Thank you so much. Worship God, and may he bless you all. Us to be. Thank you so much. Worship God, and may he bless you all.